Yup, yup, welcome into the Hot Stove Cast. I'm the Hot Stove host, Zach Simon. Thank you so much for joining me on what is the second episode of the first season, episode 102. I've got a fantastic episode lined up for you guys with some great guests. Uh, first and foremost, in no particular order, uh, the main event, Kyle McGowan, A Harrisburg Senators farmhand for the Washington Nationals. He's 26 years old, uh, right-handed was acquired in the Danny Espinosa trade and is really just striking people out left and right right now. Um, I'll get into more of his stats later, but if he keeps pitching the way he he uh, has been lately, he could have a promotion in the cards. I also spoke to Harrisburg Senators number two uh, play-by-play broadcaster uh, Greg Wong, was kind enough to talk about FNB Field, the Senators, and so forth. And last but not least, Byron Kerr of the Washington Nationals Mass and Sports Dot com. He's a reporter for the Washington Nationals, uh, was kind enough to stop by. Really looking forward to sharing that with you guys. He shared some amazing insight into guys like Juan Soto, Max Scherzer, Steven Strasburg, stuff you're really just not going to hear anywhere else. But without further ado, let's get into it. It's time for Wild Pitch. Just a bit outside. Yes, it's time for Wild Pitch, and where to begin with none other than Hawk Harrelson and Bob Euchre, who both, by the way, have little spots uh, in the, you just heard Bob Euchre just a bit outside, and you have Hawk Harrelson with his infamous stretch uh, home run call in the intro. Uh, They had a little reunion in the booth this past weekend, and as you might imagine, it was fantastic. There's a 12-minute video, uh, which I'm, of course, going to share, but I put together a little sample for you. And uh, it's it's amazing. Entering his 48th season as a broadcaster for his hometown team. And that, of course, is the one and only Bob Buchan. Bob, welcome, buddy. Hi, pal. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm you look great. You. Now, your nose, every year I see you, gets a little heavier. Well, um, it's from working out. <laughs> Bobby, thanks for stopping by. Thank you, Hawk. I love, I love you, man. Love. You know, take care of yourself. I'll be talking to you. Okay. Thank you, pal. All right. Wear that hat and get help now. <laughs> Where's the boots? <laughs> <laughs> I wish Bob Euchre was my uncle. <laughs> Bob Euchre is a, is a national treasure, and he's wholly underappreciated. I'm going to try to, to get more Bob Euchre clips on the show going forward, and Hawk Harrelson, too, for that matter. But Bob Euchre in particular is just incredible. Um, oh, you just have to watch that clip, all 12 minutes. Uh, it, it's worth it. I mean, rarely do you find a clip anywhere that's 12 minutes long that's worth watching. Uh, moving on here. I'm sure you all have seen this rally goose craze. Well, long story short, for those who don't know, there was a goose in the infield in Detroit about a week or so ago, and it wouldn't leave. It flew around and landed in the dirt, and then it finally gained its wings. It was kind of like one of those propeller airplanes, kind of just slowly taking off and chugging and chugging, and then eventually it went in a circle, and it flew up and up, and the entrance was like, oh, it's gone. He's out of here, and then bam, he hit into the uh, facade of the second deck and just plummeled down and hit his seat, and it was in shock. Uh... Fortunately, he's fine. Uh, the staff member came in and got him, took care of him. And now this goose, um, they won four games in a row, the Tigers did. I, I, I'm not sure if they've won in fifth. Um, let me let me get in there and check that for you one second. Uh, this goose, I mean, <laughs> well, they did lose today. Today is Monday. They lost the first game of the doubleheader. Um, so regardless, it wasn't... They won four consecutive games since the incident, if you will, and uh, this goose is becoming like a, an icon in Detroit. It's actually hilarious because the goose is just chilling. He's hanging out in the dugout during the game. He's just perched up above the helmets, and he's just sitting there, like, taking in the game. I mean, imagine being that goose, just free admission. I mean, good for him uh, or her, you know. This is a gender-inclusive podcast. Um, anyway, moving forward here. Um, Mike Trout, he's obsessed with the weather. Okay, 
He cites he no no really he is obsessed with the weather. Uh, it just came out today. Um, he cites various different models in preparing for games, and even uh, like when the radar gets a little funky when things are coming in, uh, he's the guy who goes into the uh, the clubhouse in between innings, checks his phones, and predicts storms. Like he said in this interview, he he looks at a. a several models like canadian model european model it's really remarkable what this guy's doing i want to really pick his brain about it um he'll go into the clubhouse and come back and say uh there's a storm coming in 15 minutes and what do you know the storm comes in 15 minutes um who would have thought i mean then again this guy's just a he's the generational player so it's like hardly surprising that he can you know do something i dare say godlike like predict the weather um Last thing on on a wild pitch here. By the way, I don't know if you heard this. John Smoltz, um, and I'll talk more about him later, but John Smoltz qualified for the Senior Open in golf. How incredible is that? I, I mean, that's not every day you, you find a, a a professional athlete. Heck, he's all of a sudden he's a he's a he's diving into the two sport athlete realm. So good for him. Uh, I know me as a Phillies fan growing up saw him just torment my Phillies, and wow, was he amazing. Um, he was kind of like Maddox-like in that he just was a tactician. He he would wear you down and really special special arm, obviously, Hall of Famer. Um, moving on here, uh, it is the usual suspects in bringing the lumber. Here's another hit, baby bomb. Go crazy, folks. This past week, Charlie Culberson hit his second pinch hit uh, uh, bomb, a walk-off hit. Uh, it was his, uh, unbelievably the second in a week span. Charlie Culberson just keeps popping up in place, hitting walk-off home runs. I mean, good for that guy. Um, another little random factoid for you. This is the first time, okay, the Mariners have been in sole possession of first place since June 1st, 2003. Oh my gosh, what is that? Fifteen, just about fifteen years ago, um, the 03 Mariners were were a healthy ninety three and sixty nine. Bob Melvin was the skipper. Pat Gillick was the GM. Players, hitters on that roster, some guy named Ichiro. You ever hear of him? Ichiro, maybe I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe you haven't heard of him. I'm not sure. Brett Boone, Randy Wynn, Edgar Martinez, who by the way should be in the Hall of Fame. I, I get this, folks. Okay, what do the following guys have in common? You ready? Barry Bonds, Hank Aaron, Babe Ruth, Albert Pujols, Mickey Mantle, Jimmy Fox, Ted Williams, Frank Thomas, Mel Ott, Gary Sheffield, Lou Gehrig, Stan Musial, Chipper Jones, Carly Stremski, Billy Williams, Al Kaline, Ricky Colavito, Todd Helton, Joe DiMaggio, Johnny Mize, Yogi Berra, and George Brett. Whew. Excuse me. Those guys all have something in common. They hit more than 300 home runs, and they walked more than they struck, struck out. Every single one of them. Now... Actually, not all of them hit over 300. They just walked more than they struck out. The following guys hit over 300. Bonds, Ruth, Pujols, Fox, Williams, Thomas, Ott, Gehrig, Musial, Jones, Yastrzemski, K-Line, Helton, DiMaggio, Mize, and Brett. Okay? Now, of those underlined, okay, only 15 of the 16 uh, are in the Hall of Fame. Why not Edgar Martinez? Okay? I mean, he hit over 300, walked more than he struck out, and hit more than 300 home runs. Um, and on top of that, he has 49 stolen bases. That's more than, uh, that's 10th out of those 15 guys. Um, the knock on Edgar Martinez for the longest time, he played in about roughly 2,200 games, a little more, uh, is that he didn't play enough. Um, and that's certainly, you know, that's certainly something to, to count for. Uh, you gotta, you gotta earn your lumps over the long haul. It's not just, uh, quality over quantity. Quantity counts in some cases here. However, you gotta... I feel like in this case you got to take that with a grain of salt because what Edgar Martinez did, hitting 312 for his career um, and hitting all these home runs, he had over 300 home runs, 309. Um, it's it's very uncommon. I mean, it's just simply uncommon. Like a guy, you got to compare him to a Carl Yastrzemski because Yastrzemski hit about uh, had about 3,300 uh, games played. Okay, that's he's literally played one third of a career uh, more than. Martinez. If Martinez, you know, if he um, had these extra at bats, uh, 
he'd have more home runs. He'd have about 495 home runs compared, uh, right, if he played the exact same amount of games as Yastrzemski. Yastrzemski would have 43 fewer. So and at what point do you say, like, what's the cutoff for games played? I'm not really quite sure what it is, but I'll tell you another thing. This guy played in the steroid era, and he was fa- he was not found uh, to have had steroids. Uh, he's just one of the best hitter ever, hitters ever. Now, the only guy on this list that kind of caught my attention who is not in the Hall of Fame, uh, by the way, and uh, uh, did he hit over 300? Let's see. He did He did hit over 300 and walked more than he struck out and had a bunch of homers. Todd Helton had more home runs than uh, uh, Edgar Martinez. The Coors Field thing, that's totally a legitimate exception to the rule. Um, you look at Todd Helton's splits, I believe he hits 45 points better. Um or 35 points better uh, at home than he did on the road. It's so common. Even a guy like uh, Nolan Arenado hits 50 points better at home than he does on the road. It's really it's uncanny. I mean, every hitter ever has said, I wish I played a course. Um, just imagine being a pitcher there. Um, anyway, so that's that. Going to take a quick break here on the Hot Stuff Cast, but before we go here on the other side, I want to let you, I want to ask you the question, who is the major league leader in home runs? Back after this. Okay, so Sarah, I'm dropping you off at Emily's? Yep. And Josh, you're going to? Soccer, Dad. Soccer practice. Right. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to let you know when I pick you both up, I'll be wearing my short shorts. What? No! Yep, and my dorky dad hat, and I'm going to do my dad dance for all your friends. They'll love it! Seriously? Why? Because I like my short shorts. Of course, I could be talked out of it if you guys would just buckle up your seatbelts without giving me a hard time. It's important to get your kids to buckle up for safety, no matter what it takes. And sometimes, all it takes is your parental powers of persuasion. Okay, okay, we're buckling up. See, all buckled. Good choice. I'll just have to do my dad dance at dinner time. What, what? No! Do what you have to to make sure your kids are wearing their seatbelts, even on short drives. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. Welcome back to the Hot Stove Cast. That trivia question from the from the break: Who leads the major leagues in home runs? Well, it was a trick question. It's actually a two horse race. Mike Trout leads the way alongside J.D. Martinez, both with 19 home runs apiece. I mean, wow! J.D. Martinez, when he's at his best, um, really is is a top five player in the game. Uh, he's had some injury woes. He hasn't really had a full bore full like season where he played all the games uh but when he is going strong he is as good as anybody he really is um i'm not gonna say he's better than trout i'm not gonna say he's better than harper i'm not gonna say he's uh i don't know if he's better than jose ramirez but he could he could best machado potentially they're two different hitters though it's not really a fair comparison um i'm not even sure who i'd rather have machado or jd martinez uh i mean in a vacuum, if they're both healthy, again, I'm not sure. Uh, you might, you probably go Machado with health, but again, if they're both healthy, who the heck knows? But anyway, that's the perfect lead-in for a segment I like to call batting cleanup. All right, Eddie Rosario has become the first player in Twins history to have multiple three home run games. Rosario is the ninth player in Major League Baseball in slugging. He's slugging 573. Are you kidding me? He trails only Arenado, Judge, Jose Ramirez, Manny Machado, J.D. Martinez, Mike Trout, and wait for it. You know who it is? Mookie Betts. Yes, Mookie Betts leads the league in slugging at 750, and he's done that in 48 games. That's a really impressive 48-game sample. Um I actually just signed up for the Baseball Player Reference Player Index, so I'm really looking forward to 
getting you guys uh, some interesting insight in that. I wanted to see, uh, and I couldn't figure it out. Uh, I wrote them, though I'm sure they'll get back soon. I wanted to figure out, uh, you know, who has had a comparable streak of, of a slugging percentage of 750 in 48 games or 213 plate appearances. That's so- you know, I, I would even say Reese Hoskins probably did something very similar to that last season. I'm sure a guy like Barry Bonds did something close to that. I wouldn't be surprised if Mike Trout or Bryce Harper uh, had similar streaks. Um, that streak uh, Josh Hamilton had in Texas that one time when he had four home runs in one game, and he just added on that. Uh, those are a few that ring bells. I'm sure Alex Rodriguez probably had one run like that, if not a couple. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely absurd what's uh, what – uh, Mookie Betts is doing right now, and obviously he's on the disabled list, so he'll, he'll be back soon. Um, let's talk about more power stats. Let's t- uh, who leads the league in hard hit percentage? Any guesses? I'll give you a second. The answer is Matt Olson of the Athletics at fifty three point four percent over half his hits are hard hit. Um, I've been a pretty big provider of Matt Olson's potential for quite some time. Uh, he's, I mean, there's, there's, he's lefty too. He's so special. Um, when it he's he had a rough start to the season, but he's really clicking late. When he gets it going, woof, he is going. Uh, JD Martinez, who I just keep talking about, is close behind him at fifty two point five percent hard hit percentage. Then there's a drop off after that. Uh, it goes down to like forty eight and a half percent. Uh, more power stats for you. Um, who's the top? Who are the top hitters in line drive percentage? Would you think? And this seems. Don't overthink this. This is actually a pretty easy answer. I'll give you a second. Joey Votto comes in at 33.5% line drive percentage, which is utterly absurd. That's a word I'm using a lot, but it's just it's the facts. 33.5%. Um, I don't know if that's ever been done before for an entire season. Now, obviously, we're only I think he's only like 250 plate appearances in, but that's that's just next level craziness. Trey Freeman is a whole, whole two points lower at 31.5%. Brandy Belt, Brandon Belt. He's having an amazing season, coming back from that concussion at 30.9%. From power hitting to power pitching, I sat down with Washington Nationals AA prospect, Harrisburg Senator Kyle McGowan. Uh, He's the reigning Eastern League Pitcher of the Week. Uh, Like I said before, if he continues his dominance, uh, he could be in for a promotion sooner than later. Uh, I watched his tape, and McGowan's slider is amazing. It just kind of sweeps. It's gone 11-5. But what really caught my attention is his fastball. When it leaves his hand, it really just sneaks up on you. And that's the kind of guy who's going to cause some trouble for hitters for a long time. If you got a fastball that's deceptive, uh, you can't even think. I mean, you can throw 100 all you want. If it's flat, the guy's going to see it. You can throw uh, 10 out of 10 people in baseball will tell you a 91-mile-an-hour fastball that, that sneaks up on you is better and it has a little bit of movement too. But if it's deceptive, it's easier than the flat fastball at 98. Every time. Every time they'll tell you that's better. Um, just a couple stats for you before we dive into this. Currently, he has a 12.41 K through 9 and a 1.46 walks through 9 in 24.2 double A Harrisburg innings, and he was kind enough to join the show. Joining the Hot Stove cast is a 2013 fifth round pick by the Los Angeles Angels. He's now a member of the Harrisburg Senators, acquired in the Danny Espinosa trade. He is out of Savannah State and Southampton, New York. His name is Kyle McGowan, and he's kind enough to give me a few minutes of his time. Kyle, how you doing? Pretty good. Nice hot day. Yeah, it's a little toasty out here. I like it. It's baseball weather. Um, now, Kyle, for the fans who don't know, your pitches are fastball, changeup, curveball, slider? No, no curveball, just the slider. Okay, okay. All right, so yeah, fastball, changeup, slider, and a devastating slider at that, folks. Um, so, Kyle, the draft is this week. Um, please take me through the moment you got drafted. Um, it's kind of a surreal moment. Uh, pretty much waited around the second day. Got a couple phone calls, and... Uh, when my name was called, I honestly never even knew uh, the Angels were interested in me. They had never made contact with me or called me beforehand, and it was just really random to see my name pop up on the screen. And I didn't even have an emotion. I just sat there, and everyone else freaked out. But I just sat there like, what? Yeah, it's got to be surreal and just shocking. I, I can't even imagine. Um, Kyle, in 2016, you were quoted as saying, quote, I love striking people out, okay? In your last three starts in 18.2 innings, you have 27 strikeouts. Tell me what's working for you right now. Uh, everything is working, I'd say, um, especially my slider. And uh, my mentality is just a lot different, and I'm going out there and trying to compete and strike everyone out. Sounds good. Um 
in 2016, you were a member of the Salt Lake uh, City Bees. Um, you said that growing up, you looked you looked up to Tim Lincecum. You had the chance to play with the guy. Um, take me through that moment when you when you met Tim Lincecum. You got to talk to him. What'd you guys discuss? Uh. A lot of random things, honestly. Not much baseball. I met him in uh, the 2008 All-Star Game at the hotel, and uh, I asked him for an autograph, and my mom's like, that looks like a little kid, and it was Tim Linscombe. But uh, I always grew up watching him and loved watching him. And uh, when I first met him, it was pretty awesome. Uh, I got to chart him that day, so it was just wow. felt like a child again almost. <laughs> And uh, we hung out a lot. Uh, we actually trained a little bit this off season at Driveline together, so it was pretty awesome. Uh, watched the Super Bowl at his house, so it's awesome. Uh, he treated me like a normal person, and it's kind of surreal. How has he helped you develop as a pitcher? Uh, we haven't really talked much about pitching, okay. but uh, I try to emulate his mechanics for a while. Um, we talked about changeups this off season a little, but other than that, I mean, it's kind of a little bit different pitching philosophy just because I mean he attacks hitters different than I do uh his out pitch and everything but uh still being able to pick a two-time Cy Young award winner's mind is pretty awesome yeah without question uh Kyle Kendrick was also a member of that 2016 uh Bees team uh it's I read that you also speak to him about pitching what what's he done to help you improve your game yeah we called him he was my dad pretty much (laughs) but uh, no uh watching Kendrick was pretty awesome too I mean he's been around for so long and the way he adjusted his game from how he used to be to now uh, I mean he's he's a true veteran and uh try to pick his brain about a cutter but unfortunately I wasn't able to pick it up World Series champion Kyle Kendrick um I throw a cutter too but that's not important um it, it is a devastating pitch I, I gotta say um anyway who who do you look up to now in the bigs uh pitching wise Probably Max Scherzer. Uh, being around him in spring training was pretty awesome. And then you see about how he goes about his work every year, and every year he's getting better and better. And just trying to pick his mind, that's pretty much where I turned my career around, I'd say, this year. Like, just picking his brain and his mentality and how, about, how he goes about his business, uh, that definitely helped me moving forward. So would you say you, you now model your game or try to model your game after Scherzer or uh, him as well as other players? or uh, A lot of players, but I mean, I like his mentality on the mound is something that definitely helped me. Um, he's ruthless. Yeah, he's, he's one of a kind, yeah. that's for sure. But uh, I try to take bits and pieces of a lot of players, and he's probably one of the main ones. What other players? Honestly, I don't have like a specific person. I just I try to pick up things here and there, um, whether it's something I'm doing in the weight room or uh, my conditioning or how I go about attacking or pitches, or whatever like that. But uh, I would say 95% is Max Scherzer. Okay, okay. Well, it's a great choice. Um, so let's switch gears just slightly. Um, you've, you've pitched a, a good bit. Who's the toughest batter you've ever faced? Uh, I would say probably Corey Seager uh, in 2014. Uh, no, 2015 in Double A Arkansas, and wow. there's no way you could pitch him, and it was pretty. I can see why he's in the big leagues. So <laughs> he is a sensational hitter. I mean, it's a shame he's he's on the sideline right now with an elbow, but he'll be back. Yeah, yeah, he will be. Um, did you know you always wanted to play baseball? Yeah. I uh, I didn't start playing till Little League. I, I didn't play T-ball or any of that. And my parents, I don't remember this clearly, but my parents said I came home one day and I was like, I just want to play baseball because all my friends are playing. So they signed me up the next day. And uh, I wrote a note in high school, no, middle school or elementary school. They would make us write notes to ourselves. So when we were seniors, we could open up and see how we've changed and everything. And I wrote, I, I want to say it was like middle school or early elementary but I wrote that I wanted to be a professional baseball player when I grew up and here we are yes here we are wow um so that you would say that was your moment when you realized you know what this is really what I want to do yeah I mean well it was either that or I was always into the military when I was young I don't know why I had no affiliation with them but my mom quickly shut that down so baseball (laughs) was the next okay so would you say if if you weren't playing baseball is that 
you know, what would what do you think you'd be doing? I know you're a business management major at Savannah State. What do you think you'd be doing if you weren't playing baseball? Yeah, I was business management, and I found out I didn't like math much. So I went to criminal justice, but uh, probably something with law enforcement. Um, hopefully, I'll never have to figure out what else I want to do. That sounds good. Um, let's bring it back to baseball. Um, do you have a, like a pregame ritual? Do you listen to uh, specific songs? Or, like wear the same socks, stuff like that? Oh yeah, I have a lot. I'm a pitcher, so um, I like music that just gets me amped up and makes me want to fight. Almost just pisses me off, <laughs> honestly, because I like like Scherzer. He's out there and he, he's not trying to be nice. So I try to, you know, just psych myself out and pretend like I'm going to go into a fight right now. Um, <laughs> other than that, I mean, I got to clean my cleats before. I try to wear the same stuff to the field if I threw good last time in that outfit or really random stuff that anybody would think I'm crazy over but I mean that's the life of a pitcher yeah you said it pitchers are different cats um I, I grew up a pitcher we we were and a tennis player we're a different breed um so you follow Eminem on Twitter you talked about music makes you want to fight um what, what's your favorite Marshall Mathers track or, or two? Oh man I, tough, s- I know I know all of them but I I saw him actually right before I came down the spring training he performed at a concert and I got to see him but I mean, you have to go with Lose Yourself. That's probably his most iconic song, and I'd, it will never get old, that's for sure. Yeah. You got one moment, one chance. Yeah, um, yeah it's a great choice. Um, all right, Kyle, we're wrapping up here with Kyle McGowan of the Harrisburg Senators, double A affiliate of the Washington Nationals. Kyle is used to exploring the waterfalls of St. Lucia and uh, the rest of the Caribbean, so, and he likes to surf too. So I wanted to ask, okay. This is this is Bapo. You ready? Yeah. You're given a hundred thousand dollars to take a vacation of a lifetime. You know, a week, give or take. Oh, yeah. um, where are you going and what are you doing? That's easy. Well, I already did Hawaii, so I don't need to go there. But Bora Bora Maldives, hundred percent. I'm a beach guy, so anything to do with water, I could literally just sit in that hut. You know, like the little cottages on the water. Sure. That's where I'd be every day. Oh, sounds like a dream. Um, well, Kyle McGowan, thank you so much for your time. This was a real treat. All right, thanks for having me. Really appreciate Kyle McGowan for joining the show. I'm looking forward to seeing what he does for the remainder of his professional career. From one pitcher to more pitching, it is now time for Painting the Corners. Swing and a miss, struck him out. Let's start off painting the corners with some Blake Snell, who recorded a franchise record by striking out the first seven batters for Seattle. I find him talking a lot of Seattle in this podcast, but by no coincidence, they're in first place in their division. But anyway, he struck out seven batters, the first seven. Um, that's <laughs> There aren't superlatives for that. Good for him. Um, he's kind of been up and down, but he has all the potential of uh, to be, uh, he could be as good as Chris Archer, I think. I don't think that's unreasonable. Chris Archer, I wish he could find a way to throw more than five innings and still get those 11 strikeouts. But, you know, it's a learning process. Everybody's everybody's got to take some time to develop. Um, moving on uh, in uh, painting the corners. 23 years ago and one day today in 1995, Pedro Martinez pitched a nine-inning perfect game, but it didn't officially count uh, because he gave up a hit in the bottom of the 10th. You know, tough luck strikes. What have there been like 24 perfect games all time? I'm Googling that for you. One second. Perfect games all time MLB. Uh, I don't want them ranked. Yeah, there have been 23 perfect games. 23 years ago, huh? Interesting coincidence. LeBron's playing in the finals. Coincidences abound. Anyway, like I said. You'll get a like I said in the last episode. You'll get a little bit of everything on this podcast, but it is a baseball show. And since I'm on that track, let me clarify: this is going to be a show with 50% minors, 50% majors. Okay, going forward, just so you know, that's that's what it is. Um, I want to I want to have everybody here. Anyway, continuing painting the corners. I talked about John Smoltz earlier, qualifying for the U.S. Senior Open in his baseball career. He was, and by the way, he looked good golfing. He got a good swing, compact, you know, mechanically sound, which is. You know, when you think about the guy's career uh, in baseball, it's hardly surprising. Um, in his major league career, he was 213 and 155 with 154 saves. Um, 
he pitched 21 years in the big, in the big leagues. Uh, like I said earlier, he's a tactician. And uh, he's in the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame, to the surprise of no one. Uh, bringing it to present day, uh, Braves arms, speaking of which, let's talk about Mike fulton Former Astros farmhand, has a, a 2.22 ERA in 69 innings pitched. He averages 96.3 on his fastball. Among starting pitchers, he trails only Charlie Morton, Shohei Otani, Noah Syndergaard, and Luis Severino. By the way, behind him? Garrett Cole, Walker Bueller, and Garrett Richards. That's uh, just otherworldly great company to be in uh, for Mr. fulton Um We shall see um, what what is in store for him. Moving on here, I had the privilege to speak with MassInSports.com reporter for the Washington Nationals, Byron Kerr, joined the Hot Stove cast. Joining the Hot Stove cast is a MassInSports.com reporter, co-host of Nats Extra on Masson TV. He also does play-by-play for a variety of networks, including the AAC, Big Ten, and ESPN, and GW Men's Basketball. Byron Kerr is kind enough to join the Hot Stove cast. Byron, thanks so much for your time. How you doing? Good, man. Thanks for having me on, Zach. Appreciate you joining us, or joining me, rather. Uh, let me take you back to uh, July 2nd, 2015, the National sign. Uh, then 16-year-old outfielder Juan Soto of the Dominican Republic for just a $1.5 million signing bonus. I mean, this is looking as it's looking like as good of a deal as, as possibly like the Louisiana Purchase almost. I mean, he's less than he's he's been in the league less than three years, uh, and the minors that is. He's got less than uh, 35 at bats in Double A, and he's coming up to the majors at just 19. He's absolutely crushing the ball hitting 326 i mean how much has he meant to the to the club thus far in his in his young career well especially since they've had a lot of injuries to some front line guys and, and you know over the past uh, 10 or 12 years or so since they just, you know became a major league baseball team they worked very hard in accruing talent in the pitching and catching a lot of pitchers a lot of catchers in the minor leagues and, and in that time they also worked very hard in reestablishing a an academy, a baseball academy in the Dominican Republic, and Johnny DePuglia and the rest of his staff, the director of international scouting for the Nationals, worked very hard uh, to find players in the Dominican. It's you know, baseball players, and they were able to find Victor Robles there, and he's considered their top prospect, a five-tool player that can pretty much do it all. And they also found Juan Soto, as you mentioned, who is considered a prototypical a corner outfielder with tremendous power may not be the all-around super player that they expect from Victor Robles, but certainly is going to be a legit Major League Baseball player if he continues on this track. And Last year, he was injured with a hammy injury and an ankle injury that slowed his development. He was only 18 last year, and this year, obviously, he's 19 and has come out of the blocks healthy. And because of what happened with the team with so many different injuries, guys like Adam Eaton and Brian Goodwin and Rafael Bautista in the outfield, he got a shot much earlier than uh, many would have expected, and maybe even the Nationals brass and Juan Soto would expect that he would be able to make this move. But as you mentioned, he didn't have many at-bats at the lower levels, but one thing they noticed was his tremendous ability to understand what a pitcher was trying to do, able to, able to work counts very well, and just – a chronologic, as Mike Rizzo said, from his chronological age, is way beyond where he was at age 19. He was looking like a, a hitter who had been in the major leagues for five or six years, the way he's able to uh, work counts and get the pitch that he wants. It's just unprecedented for a 19-year-old. And then he demonstrated his power. And I think uh, I wrote something like that on Twitter about four of the five stops he had uh, this uh, early spring and summer. He had him run in his first to batter his first game. So... Uh, he's been a tremendous uh, uh, find for the Nationals, and certainly, you know, a, a hat tip to their international scouting department, which has done a really nice job in the Dominican. And uh, Juan Soto is probably the first of many, but he could be a, he could be a very very special player with the way he's been able to start. Yeah, absolutely incredible what he's done thus far. Uh, in five years, I mean, he's only 19. Just imagine what he could do. He's got a currently, I mean, it's only 48, uh, 46 at bats. He's got a 415 on base. He's striking out 17 percent of the time. But you have to remember, he's 19. Uh, just ridiculously impressive. Um, moving on to the guys who you know have been with the team for a while. Uh, let's talk about. Can can you tell me about the resiliency of the Nats uh, to continue to to be near the top of the standings uh, without key contributors like Dan Murphy, Adam Eaton, Zimmerman, Kendrick, and Weeters? Yeah, I mean, it's almost uh, amazing that you just said that, that they're still 
uh, near the top of the NL East, and it's all because of the starting pitching, which is, I think, the best in the National League. And their bullpen has done a nice job of keeping them close in games. And the, the big three of the law firm of Brandon Kinsler, Ryan Madsen, and Sean Doodle have done a nice job. But you cannot start this conversation without talking about Max Scherzer, Steven Strasburg, Gio Gonzalez, Tanner Roark, and even Jeremy Hellickson until he got hurt over the past weekend. Uh, he was a, a great find at the number five because they were looking for somebody to replace Joe Ross, who's out with Tommy John. But there's just nobody like Scherzer and uh, Strasburg in a one-two punch like that, and that's the reason why they're still near the top of the division, even though, as you said, they've lost so many combined man games to guys that could be all-stars if they were healthy. So the offense is certainly hasn't been able to keep up with the pitching, but because the starting pitching and the bullpen has done such a nice job, it's been able to keep them in so many games. and give them a chance to stay uh, near the top of the NL East with still well over 100 games left. Yeah, Bryce Harper said the backbone of your team is the starting pitching. Um, can you expand on what ways uh, Scherzer and Strasburg just continue to amaze you every time they take the mound? Well, I think that Scherzer is the uh, ultimate workaholic. Uh, he, in the greatest example, was the, uh, you know, this weekend in Atlanta where he was able to get, a, get on base and then go from first to home on a base hit and score. And the fact that he's able to hit, he takes pride in, in not giving up those at-bats. He actually has a hitting schedule. Uh, he works very hard at that part of his game. And if you have a starting pitcher that actually works that hard on his hitting, uh, that just shows you uh, what kind of player he is. And, you know, he's he's my most fun interviews act that I ever do is because he's so cerebral about the game. He has so much respect for the game. And any question you ask, he takes it uh, – you know, honestly, and, and, and talks about how important it is for him to throw strikes and to get ahead of hitters. And, and he's just one of the most competitive people I've ever been around. And uh, he, you know, kind of doesn't take no for an answer when he's dealing with any hitter that he faces. So, uh, you know, he just is a powerhouse. He's a, he's, a, he's a bull out there. He doesn't mess around. And, you know, Steven Strasburg has done a nice job of not letting little things bother him in the last couple of years. And that's, I think that's improved his game. He's kind of simplified things. He used to take losses very hard. Uh, he used to get down on himself in the middle of games. And he doesn't do that anymore. He's letting his uh, immense talent kind of uh, take over. And I think that, you know, having Max Scherzer as his teammate kind of is the reason for that. And so together, uh, they've done a nice job. They're totally different people, obviously. Strasburg's a pretty quiet guy, but he's got a, you know, incredibly lethal uh, fastball, and his, and his curveball is is you know, tremendous and, and having a, a, a change up that he can hit 89, 90 on and no one, no one in the major leagues has that, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're throwing 98, 99 fastballs as well. So uh, it's incredible that the nationals have not only one, but actually I always call them the two aces instead of just one ace and to have Scherzer and Strasburg together. Uh, it's gonna, It makes it very difficult for other teams to, to even win series when they have to face those two guys. Just an incredible one-two punch, like you said, virtually unrivaled in all of baseball. Speaking of uh, MassInSports.com reporter Byron Kerr, uh, I mentioned Bryce Harper earlier. I mean, what more is there to say about this guy? I mean, he's having a phenomenal season, and you could even say he's not performing to the best of his ability. His batting average on balls is play, uh, balls in play is 100 points below his average mark. Um, can you speak? I, I mean, that that pretty much, I don't want to I don't want to get too carried away, but it tells you there's room to improve for this guy, which is mind-boggling uh, when you really think about it. But can you speak to how much he means to the Nats lineup on, on uh, from night to night? Yeah, I mean, he's very important. If he's got 18 homers near the, the top of the division, at top of the league in, in power hitting, and uh, as you mentioned, he'd be the first to tell you that you know he's not thrilled with the way things have gone to start this year as far as his average goes. You know, at the beginning of the year, he was getting walked a ton. Uh, after that, they put him in the in the leadoff role. He started to get a couple of more uh pitches but then he realized that you know they were mostly going to give him a lot of slop and that he wasn't he was only going to have one pitch per at bat where he could actually get a hold of it so that's been a little bit frustrating i think for him but yes absolutely to have a guy like that in your lineup day in and day out even if he's not at 100 percent as far as where he would like to be hitting wise that's very important to have a guy like like bryce harper around and uh, he said to us in Miami that, you know, it's okay if he hits 230 and, and hits 40 homers, which was uh, kind of surprising, you know, but I, I just don't see him hitting 230 for the whole season. I think he could go well above 260 and still hit the 40-plus homers. And, uh, you know, 
I think the not, not as you said, not having Ryan Zimmerman, not having Daniel Murphy, guys like that around him, has affected his play a little bit. But um, you know, he's he's still the, one of those difference makers that you want, and very few teams have anybody like a Bryce Harper. So other teams have to game plan for him when they face him, and that just gives you an idea how important he is to the Nationals. Wrapping up here with Nats beat reporter for Masson dot com, uh, Masson Sports dot com rather, uh, Byron Kerr. Byron, what's your favorite thing? Switching gears a little bit. What's your favorite thing or two to eat at Nationals Park? Well, that's a good question because uh, you know if they don't have something in the media area that I like, then we'll sneak down to Shake Shack. I'm pretty simple uh, as far as that goes, and, and get one of those Shack burgers and one of those uh, milkshakes. But the, they also have something called the pinch dumpling, which is really good. It's a, a Chinese dumpling type thing that has beef or chicken in, or uh, I think vegetables as well. So that's really tasty as well. Something you don't really don't find at a ballpark. So those are my two go-to's at Nats Park. Dim song at the park. I'm all about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll have to get down there and uh, give it a shot. Um, if you've never been to DC Nats Park, you got to get down there. It was open in 2008. I mean, obviously there's plenty to do in DC. Um, and a little unique wrinkle to Nationals Park, they have the Half Street Fairgrounds, which opened two hours before and two hours after the game. Uh, they have beverages, food, concerts, and they even have like a food truck festival uh, every month, April through October. Um, you'll be glad you went to Nats Park um, for the product on and off the field. Uh, MassonSports.com beat reporter Byron Kerr, thank you so much for joining me. All right, yeah, Zach, uh, thanks for the time, and we'll, we'll check you down the road. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Byron, for joining the show. Uh, I lived in D.C. for two years, so I'm very familiar with Nationals Park in D.C. as a whole. I, you know, I highly recommend taking the trip. I mean, there's so much history. There's just uh, you run out of things. You, you make a list of things to do, and you wind up only doing a third of it because there is so much to do there. Although, if I'm being perfectly honest, don't go in August. It is so humid and so hot. It's the city is literally built on a swamp, and um, yeah, you will sweat before you even walk out the door. Uh, that's of course not serious, but within three seconds of leaving, you very you very well may sweat. Um, I went to school there for two years at George Washington. Wound up calling games for the radio station, college radio station, uh, and sat right next to Byron. So this is a very cool opportunity for me, perfectly honest, to speak with him uh, on this podcast. It means a lot to me. But um, yeah, get down to DC, um, and you will not regret it. Uh, particularly because the Nationals are just a really dang good team right now. They've been for years. I feel like this team could really get over the hump. Um, they have the personnel to do it. I mean, Juan Soto is is a talent they actually haven't had on this team in quite some time. He could very well possess a better bat than Anthony Rendon, who I think uh, has a tremendous approach to the plate, one of my favorites in the game. Him and Justin Turner are among my two favorite hitters in the game, and they just so happen to play. They both play third base. Rendon's a little down right now, but I think he'll turn around. Um, but, yeah. Uh, from the majors to the minors, I had a chance to sit down and speak with Greg Wong, the number two broadcaster for the Harrisburg Senators, about the Senators, FNB Field, and beyond. Joining me on the Hot Stove Cast is the number two play-by-play voice of the Harrisburg Senators. He is also a native of San Francisco, uh, big-time Giants fan. Greg Wong is kind enough to join the program. Greg, how you doing? Good, Zach. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate a few minutes of your time. Greg, let's dive right into it. The Senators. I actually just spoke to Kyle McGowan. Um, he was just named the Eastern Player of the Week, Eastern League Player of the Week. Uh, what have you seen as far as improvements in, uh, in his game goes? Well, last season he was acquired in a trade uh, that brought Danny Espinoza to, uh, that sent him from the Nationals to uh, the Los Angeles Angels. And Espinosa now no longer with the Angels. In fact, he I think he just got released uh, from uh, the Dodgers, I want to say. Don't quote me on that. But anyway, McGowan was the piece that they got back. And last season in his first year with the Senators, uh, he struggled. He was giving up a lot of home runs. He started the year at AAA, then he went to AA, and then he even went briefly to single A before coming back to the Senators for a couple games at the end of the season. And this season, he really does look like a completely different pitcher one thing that I've noticed has been his breaking ball that so far hitters at this level have just not been able to lay off of. And he's racking up the strikeouts. He had back-to-back 10 strikeouts games when he had won the Eastern League Pitcher of the Week. And there had not been a senator that had struck out 10 or more in a game since 2016 prior to those two starts. And he did it two straight times. It really was that good breaking ball, that slider, that he was getting a lot of swings and misses on, a lot of chases on. And it's been his best pitch. 
uh, since he's come back, and the results have been really good. Yeah, that slider's really special. Uh, moving on here, the Senators are two and a half games back of the Akron Rubber Ducks. Um, you, you know, anything can happen. It's a long season. Um, what players in the Senators have caught your attention do you think could propel the Senators to a first or second half playoff berth? Well, for one, McGowan. He's definitely one of them. Um, they start, got off to a slow start in April, but in May they really started to turn it on. Uh, guys like Kyle McGowan and Brady Dragmeyer, who has been their opening night starter, and he's been one of the best pitchers in the Eastern League this season. They have two really electrifying young, ar- young arms in Luis Reyes and Jeffrey Rodriguez. The pitching is really what improved from April to May. They had the worst ERA in the month of April in the Eastern League, and in the month of May, they had the third best ERA. I've talked to uh, the Senators manager, Matt Lecroy, about this, but Senators had Juan Soto at double-A for about a week and a half, and though he wasn't here that long, Matt thinks that that really helped the lineup. It provided them some extra confidence, gave them a boost the week and a half he was here where he really hit the ball well. And the Senators, just as a whole, are playing good baseball here in the final, the uh, second month of the season, you know, you never know in terms of player moves, who's going to still be with the team a couple months from now, but if you, you told me that they were going to be in this position right now, uh, a month ago, I would be really amazed, and they've really done a nice job to turn it around. They've, As we're recording this today, on June 2nd, they've won 11 out of 13 games, so pretty remarkable stuff by the Senators. Yeah, you mentioned Juan Soto. I talked about him on the on the, uh, on the pilot episode. He is a really special player. Um, something to watch for for Nats fans for many years to come. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit here for the fans of the Harrisburg Senators here at F and B Field. Uh, you guys have some pretty special promotions. I, I want you. I want to talk about them a little bit. Uh, you have kids run the bases on Sundays. You have Wet Nose Wednesdays where the dogs are in the park. Uh, you have Star Wars Night uh, where the players will be playing in Star Wars jerseys on the the uh, 29th of June. And my personal favorite. Cowboy Monkey Rodeo on the 1st of July is a Sunday. Highly recommend you all come out for that. But but uh, what promotions uh, uh, should fans be excited for this season, Greg? Well, we have the Human Cannonball coming up. That's coming up later in the summer. That is uh, that is going to be a huge event here in Harrisburg. Um, and like you mentioned, the, the Cowboy Monkey Rodeo, um, he was here last season. He's been here uh, a few times, and that always brings out a lot of fans. <laughs> it's literally a cowboy uh, or a, a monkey riding a goat through the outfield maybe not a goat some yeah type riding of, dogs herding goats herding goats thank you yeah, thank I you zach you. um and uh it's yeah, unlike anything you've a, ever seen kind of a random concept yeah and they uh, the fans love it and i really liked it last year too um so that's always fun tonight is zombie night at the park so we have a a, a zombie makeup artist that's going to be in the stands um on the concourse painting people in zombie makeup the local uh, artists, so a lot of fun attractions coming to FNB Field this season. Always something different here at FNB Field, all minor league stadiums. Here. You never really know what to expect. You're going to see a bunch of zombies tonight. If you didn't know what was happening, you'd think the apocalypse was uh, afoot. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit here, Greg, as we're wrapping up here with Greg Wong, number two play-by-play voice of the Harrisburg Senators. Um, for minor league fans who like to travel, is there a stadium that you'd recommend to see the Senators? Well, absolutely, so especially to see the Senators. My, I haven't been to every ballpark in the Eastern League because the number one voice of the Senators is Terry Byram. He's been the voice for now 14 seasons. But uh, my favorite ballpark that I've traveled to and limited travel experience in the Eastern League is definitely Reading. Um, I, I went to Hartford this past week. That was an awesome experience. That's a brand-new ballpark. If you're looking for just a modern, really nice ballpark, go to Hartford because that's – brand new and it looks brand new it's pretty much a major league park that is minor league size uh, but Reading to me was the the quintessential minor league baseball experience uh, the Reading fight and fills that's just an incredible ballpark it has so much history you really feel the tradition when you walk into the park there are always a lot of fans there obviously other than FNB field um, to watch the center is definitely Reading uh, there's just there's just something about the place it's so historic they do a great job honoring past fight and fills and former fight and fills that are Philly's legends it is a it's a wonderful place and they do some excellent excellent on-field promotions and on-field entertainment yeah it's really it's a culture up there it's it's um it's they really do a great job I was actually just there in Reading a, a couple weeks ago watching Vlad Guerrero Jr yes. uh who wow special talent and Hartford is also an incredible stadium um also went there it is very modern um really beautiful if uh it's totally worth the trip um wrapping up here with Greg Wong 
Uh, Greg, uh, I mentioned Vlad Guerrero Jr. Are there players in Double A who have caught your attention uh, outside of the centers? Yeah, well, you mentioned the guy that's right at the top of the list. Vlad Guerrero Jr. is really special. He every single ball that he swing, swung at here in Harrisburg, I think he squared up. Now that's probably an exaggeration, but that's what the way it felt. He uh, he was pretty incredible. Even his outs were loud. Um, he was taking a good swing on everything. You know, he had more walks than strikeouts last season. He has more walks than strikeouts this season. So he's not just a guy that swings at everything. He just has such a good idea of what he's doing at the plate. He's only 19 years old. So Vlad Guerrero Jr., definitely the guy at the top of the list. Another guy who was in Hartford is Brendan Rodgers. He is their third baseman slash shortstop. He's also one of the top prospects in the game. He, uh, he's one of those guys, middle infielders that hit for his type of power just don't come along very often and he is really a tremendous player that has hit some of the longer home runs that I've seen. I saw him play when he was in Asheville with the Tourist, the low A affiliate of the Rockies, and he hit some long, long home runs there. I think I saw one that he hit 440 feet that they measured out on StatCast and again this season he is uh, he's really swinging the bat well. He's been one of the best hitters in the league. So those are the two guys, Guerrero and Rogers. Uh, wrapping up here, one last question for you, uh, Greg. And, and like I said, you're a San Francisco native. I kind of want to switch gears just a little bit, uh, um, switch it up just just a tad. Um, is baseball, in your opinion, like you've been on the East Coast now for a couple of years, is the style of play, is the flow a little different? Like is there a difference notable from West Coast style play to East Coast style play? Um, you know, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, there's definitely a different feel, when you, especially there's a different feel in, when it comes to sports on the East Coast than the West Coast. Uh, it's it's stereotypical to say that the West Coast is more relaxed than the East Coast because, you know, the West Coast has some extremely dedicated sports fans. I grew up a Giants fan. I've been to AT&T Park more times than I can count, and that park gets really buzzing when the team's doing well. So I don't know if uh, if there is a different... There is certainly more exposure, not necessarily exposure, but there's more media attention in certain parts of the East, like when I've been to New York and Boston, those type of places, there is just a different feel. But in terms of the style of play, you know, uh, from my experience, it just seems like it's baseball. You know, there's, um, I don't know if I've seen a different style of play from the West and the East side. It's it's really just baseball at the end of the day and um, the game is the game, if that makes sense. No, totally. Um, you know, you, you hear about how the West Coast is more laid back. I figured I'd just throw that out there. Um, Greg, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Absolutely, Zach. Have a good day. Greg Wong, number two voice of the Harrisburg Senators. Another thank you to Greg Wong for joining the show. Uh, it was a pleasure to speak Harrisburg Senators with him. We'll talk a little Kyle McGowan, among other things, FNB Field. Um, something I didn't mention in the interview was the food at, at uh, Harrisburg at FNB Field at Double A Harrisburg, uh, they have something called the Spot Dog. They're infamous. No, I'm sorry, not infamous. They are famous uh, in the region. Uh, they've been there for a very long time. They have their own little creations. I guess they're kind of infamous for being like highly unique. But uh, it's give it a shot. Uh, the Spot Dog is very good. I went there a couple years ago. Uh, it's fantastic. Also caught word of a fantastic uh, little thing they got going there for 36 bucks. You get to sit behind home plate and you have all you can eat for. I think an hour and a half into the game and an hour into the game and uh, uh, soft drinks are included and uh, you're right on home plate. It, apparently the food is delicious. Uh, I'll have to perhaps check this out one time uh, next time I'm there. Um, but we talked about minor league baseball, obviously, uh, Greg and I did, and, and uh, Double A is in Harrisburg. And, and as they say in, in a lot of the minors, the majority of prospects are in double a so that's where the talent is and if you happen to be in the region you want to go to harrisburg it's a quick drive from philadelphia pittsburgh it's a eh, you can you can make the trip uh or you can even go to altoona you never know when your favorite prospects uh, or your favorite team's players are going to be rolling through there um it's an experience i highly recommend uh checking out fnb field at least once they just renovated it with a over 45 million dollar renovation so it's it's a cozy place and one of my favorite parts about it is not all minor league par- parks have this it's a 360 concourse you can walk around the entire stadium um i know my hometown a lot of stadiums do this uh there's so many i mean you don't have to they just added it at fenway actually in the past couple decades uh um they, they, I don't think they added it. They might have added it at Wrigley. I have to check. But I know Citizens Bank Park, uh, Camden Yards, uh, uh, City Field, a lot of the places have it. But um, it, it makes the experience cooler when you can go out to the center field and check things out. And, and yeah. Uh, but moving on here, 
rounding out the show is a segment I like to call uh, Call to the Pen. Yes, bring in the reliever. It's closing time. It's time to call to the pen. Uh, because it's a pretty Nats-heavy episode, I decided I'd take this chance to uh, dissect the most recent uh, closer swap for the Nationals where they acquired Sean Doolittle. Um, let's talk about the Athletics Hall before I, I save the best for last. Uh, the the A's acquired this guy, Sheldon Neus, 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 N-E-U-S-E, Neus, I'm going to go. Um uh, he hasn't. He was. He has a 60 grade power uh, per for yeah, per fan graphs. Um, but he hasn't homered in 70 consecutive games between Double A AA and Triple A between in the past uh, since 2017. Even though he hit seven home runs in High A in 2017, so I'm not. You know, it's it's early, but it, it's tough to say much about his big league prospects uh, going forward. Obviously, if he's not hitting homers right now, he's got that 60 power grade. Something is not clicking for him. That said. Uh, they also acquired the A's acquired a prospect named Jesus Luzardo, who in 32.2 uh, double A innings this season has a 10.49, a two, a 10.47 rather, a K through nine, a 3.03 walks per nine, a 4.68 ERE. However, he's got a 3.45 xFIP, uh, which many, um, if you don't know, uh, is a predictor of future performance. Uh, so that. It is basically saying he, he should have an ERA somewhere in the ballpark of three four five. So who knows what could happen for this guy? I mean, he's got some positive factors as well backing up that uh, uh, predict, predictive metric. A twelve point five swing strike rate. He's got a solid ground ball rate of forty seven point two. He's got a, a stat I really like, and I almost hear nobody mention it. Is IFFB percentage? It's infield fly ball percentage, aka pop ups. I think it's highly useful for hitters uh, and pitchers. Obviously, pitchers, if, they, if they're inducing a lot, if they have a high percentage, it's it's excellent. Uh, his percentage is 14.8, which is on the higher side. Uh, it's, if I had to put money on it, and I, I do not bet on baseball, but if I had to put money on it, I would lean toward him making the majors. Um, but enough of that. Those are the prospects. Um, I, I, I think the uh, the A's definitely did well with Lazardo. But moving on here, uh, Blake Trinan and the A's obviously acquired – He's an interesting pitcher, Blake Trinan. First of all, he's, he's excelling. He's got a .95 ERA uh, in 28 and a third innings, uh, as well as an 11.2K through nine. Um, but Trinan, actually, he's got a nice pitch mix. He's, he throws a fastball 15.6% of the time, a cutter 3% of the time. He's a big sinker guy, and this sinker is nasty. You have to watch it. Wow. It just drops off the face of the earth and even moves sideways, too. I think it goes like from right to left. Uh, it, it's something else. And he throws a slider to boot, which I believe goes in the other direction. He throws that 30% of the time. Um, so, you know, like I said, 0.95 ERA. Uh, he's got a 51.4 ground ball rate. I'm a big ground ball rate guy. I think uh, if pitchers have a ground ball rate over 50%, uh, they're usually going to find success more often than not. Uh, it's just a safe bet. I mean, you got four infielders for th- first three outfielders. I mean, just just think about it. Um, but let's talk about Sean Doolittle. Um who I will compare to Trinan shortly, but before I get to that, Doolittle's profile is particularly interesting. He throws fastballs 89.9% of the time. Let that digest for a second, okay? Fastballs 89.9% of the time. He throws a changeup 6.8% of the time and a slider 3.3% of the time. <laughs> 90, 9 in 10 pitches from this guy are fastballs. That's ob- I don't think anybody does that. It's insane. Uh, I will get back to you on that. Um, Doolittle is, although the ERA is higher, higher 1.17 or 1.71 uh, in 21, 26.1 innings, he's got a 13 K through nine and a one walk rate. I mean, that's, he's outperforming trying in that category. Um, let's talk about swinging strike, right? Both, both of these guys are just doing excellent work. Trying is at 18.7% and Doolittle's at 19.9%. Um, Doolittle historically has been a fly ball pitcher, and he's doing that again this season. He gives up, he gives up sixty point four percent fly balls to just twenty point eight percent ground balls, and I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you, but you know, in layman's terms, Doolittle's giving up a lot of fly balls. Uh, the home runs could be, they could sneak up on him. Uh, his fastball is ninety four point two versus Trinan's is uh, sixty ninety six point eight. 
Uh, but those home runs for Doolittle, you know, when it gets really hot in D.C. in those months I was talking about, uh, you could see a couple saves where the ball just scrapes over the wall. Um, because, again, you're, you're playing with fire if you're a pitcher with a high fly ball rate. Now, granted, you know, Doolittle versus – this is a big stat. Doolittle's infield fly ball rate is 18.8%. That's very high. Versus Trinan, who just has a 5.6%. I mean, you can have a high, you can have a high fly ball rate and not induce hard contact, uh, and that's basically what Doolittle's doing here. Um, so if you ask me right now who won this trade, it's really tough to say. Um, frankly – Oh, that's really tough. I would take knowing that Trinan is is not quite as good, but he's definitely performing to a level very, 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 very comparable to Doolittle. I don't know the contract situation, and I apologize for that. Um, um, and I, that could be that could be a deciding factor. Um, but I must say, uh, I would side the way of the A's because of this Luzardo guy, uh, the Double A Jesus Luzardo, the pitcher. There's some upside there. And I think, um, you know, he's he's young. Uh, I believe he's only twenty. Let me let me pull that up for you. Um, because if he's only twenty, like I think he is, uh, then the room to grow. Yeah, he's only twenty. The fact that this guy has a ten point four seven strikeouts per nine in Double A at age twenty, uh, there's room to grow. Um, and last season in, in A ball, granted it was fourteen point two innings, he had a one point two three ERA. Um, so who knows? Again. Assets are important in baseball. If you ask me who I'd rather close on my team right now, it's Sean Doodle-Little without question. Um, but it's not super far off. Um, nonetheless, I really appreciate you for tuning into this episode 102 of the Hot Stove Cast. More episodes on the way. Uh, this week I was a little crazy because it was a short week. Uh, but I assure you in the future, uh, things will... I'll have much more updated. Follow me on, on Twitter at HotStoveCastMC. Going to have a Facebook page going by the time the next episode airs, and I will do my best to have a website going. Um, but, yeah, you can find the show on YouTube, obviously. Um, I will be Instagramming as well. Insta, whatever whatever the kids say. I don't know. <laughs> this is all a work in progress here, and I'm really, I'm really, really happy you guys are joining, uh, joining in, and hopefully enjoying the show. Uh, this is a lot of work behind the scenes, and uh, I'm very, very grateful uh, that y'all are tuned in. But until next time, um, that will be next week at Monday at 6 p.m. We'll be talking more hot stove cast. I'm dropping by FNB Field uh, this week and have an interview coming your way potentially. So. Can't really give away too many more details now, but I assure you, I think you're going to like it. Thanks so much for listening. Take that for data.